When Udonis Haslam retired at the end of the 2022-2023 NBA season, it closed the book on one of the league's most underappreciated eras. The big three, the Heatles, LeBron James in Miami. Every last one of LeBron James's teammates with the Miami Heat are now out of the association. Hell, all but Haslam couldn't even make it out of the 20 tens. It's remarkable when you sit and think about it. How is that even possible? What happened to all of LeBron's Heat teammates? I'm Cheyenne Hollis. This is the touchback, and today it's the story of the last Heatle. Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. I'm I want to begin this video with a disclaimer. I have zero interest in the debate about LeBron's status when it comes to being an all-time great or being the GOAT or whatever the case may be. Dude is a lightning rod for opinions and so be it. That is not what I'm interested at looking at today. I do want to say this. As a whole, we don't appreciate the tweens when it comes to basketball. People always look down on this era of the sport, which I think is very unfortunate. What we have is essentially the last stand of hero ball before analytics came in and meant that every team essentially was doing a slightly different version of the same thing. You can hate the fact that the big three formed in Miami and so be it. However, when you look at all of the different teams and all of the different styles we found in the NBA at this moment in history, I think it's something that was really fun to watch, whether it be the Heat, the Spurs, whatever the hell was happening in Indiana, D. Rose in Chicago. There were so many unique styles happening across the league that made it fun to watch unless you happen to be a Sacramento Kings fan. With that out of the way, let's find out what happened to every single one of LeBron James's Miami Heat teammates. And we start with Udonis Haslam, the last one to retire. He, of course, hung around Miami for nine seasons after James left town, although Haslam only appeared in 184 games over that span. Of course, Haslam's role with the Heat during those nine seasons, it was more about fostering the Heat culture more than any on-court contributions. Haslam is really the embodiment of all things Miami if you sit down and think about it. In fact, I'd argue he's really deserving of a moniker such as, say, Mr. 305. Ah, oh, no, 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 damn it! One, two, three, four, uno, dos, tres, I know you want me. Anyone who spent any amount of time in Europe during the summer of 2009 already knows this, but that song was freaking everywhere. It was the most ridiculous thing ever. I have heard I Know You Want Me, parentheses, Caliocho, about a million times, and it all happened during the summer of 2009. Thank you, Pitbull. Thank you, Mr. Worldwide. Thank you, Mr. 305. I hope I never hear that song again, though. Moving on, Haslam was an important role player on those Heatles side, but we need to now look at the other two components of the big three. There can be no debate Dwayne Wade was on the downside of his career when James decided he was going home back to Cleveland. In fact, this had to have been a major reason why he decided that, you know, maybe it was best to finally vacate South Beach. As for Wade, he was with the Heat for two more seasons, being named an All-Star each year, but this wasn't the player close to what we had seen previously. The former Marquette standout signed a ill-fated free agent contract with the Chicago Bulls in the summer of 2016, but was waived after a single season playing for his hometown team. Wade linked up with James again in Cleveland. This was a poor fit though, and he was traded back to Miami after 46 games. It was there where Flash would carry on until 2019. I know he's a Hall of Famer, but the world doesn't truly appreciate just how good of a player Chris Bosh was. Part of that was due to the fact he was exiled on some pretty bad Toronto Raptors teams early in his career and then went to Miami where he was the third member of the Big Three. 
But Bosch was so outstanding and really fun to watch, a malleable big man who was able to do whatever the Heat needed at any given moment. Like Wade, Bosch hung around Miami for the two seasons following LeBron's departure, but each of those campaigns ended early due to blood clot issues. These, of course, would eventually force him to retire. While Bosch didn't officially call it a career until 2017, his last game played in the NBA took place in 2016. We now move on to the important role players who most people will probably remember for their time in Miami. Perhaps there was no more important role player than Ray Allen. It's easy to forget that the Boston Celtics had a 3-2 series lead in the 2012 NBA Eastern Conference Finals before LeBron just blew them off the court in two straight games. This was enough to convince Ray Allen to change sides the following season, a move that basically annihilated the original Big 3 in Boston. Look, Allen was well past his prime by the time he showed up in South Beach, but his shooting proved invaluable for the Heat over two seasons. He would decide to retire after James went back to Cleveland. After losing in the NBA Finals to the Dallas Mavericks in that first Heatles season, Miami sought out Shane Battier to serve as the basketball equivalent of an innings-eating starting pitcher who wasn't necessarily the best, but was effective at what he did. Look, Battier wasn't ever going to win you a game by himself, but he also wasn't going to lose you one either. Like Ray Allen, Battier retired once the Heatles broke up. After Pat Riley had finished all of the transactions that would bring the Big Three together in Miami, the team then went out and signed free agent Mike Miller to a five-year contract. While he was never healthy for an entire season during his run in Miami, Miller played a key role for the team for three years before being waived via the Amnesty Clause in 2013. The wing player signed for Memphis before reuniting with LeBron in Cleveland for a season and then eventually closing out his career in Denver. Was Mario Chalmers any good? It's a question that no one seems to have the answer to. Of course, playing point guard next to LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh means you are very much a passenger most games. And yet, Chalmers hung around all four years of the Heatles, playing an essential role for the franchise. He certainly stepped up on occasion, but was also receiving near-constant scorn from teammates and fans alike. When James left town, Chalmers actually inked an extension with the Heat before being traded to the Memphis Grizzlies in the 2015-16 season. The point guard would rupture his right Achilles tendon in March of 2016 and no side bothered signing him the following year. After recovering in full from his Achilles injury, he would link back up with the Grizzlies and played a bit part role for them in the 2017-18 campaign. After that, Chalmers would head overseas and also spend some time in the G League but has not appeared in an NBA game since 2018. We move away from those essential role players to a collection of guys who were kind of important but also very interchangeable when you think about it. This list starts with none other than Joel Anthony. Let's be honest here, Joel Anthony was nothing but a lumbering center whose best attribute apart from being tall was affordability. His career can best be summed up by a single performance against the Portland Trailblazers in 2011. In this game, the center played 19 minutes without recording a point, rebound, assist, steal, or block. This is an NBA record for anonymity. Anyway, Anthony was traded for Tony Douglas during the final season of the Heatles there, and he bounced around the NBA for a few more years after that. The center would be out of the league by 2017, but continued his playing career in Argentina. Chris Birdman Anderson, perhaps the most loved member of the Miami Heat during the Big Three era. It's hard to find anyone who doesn't like Chris Anderson, and it's easy to see why given his story and what he overcame. That aside, Denver released Anderson in the 2012 offseason, but Birdman wouldn't sign for another team until the Heat 
offered him a 10-day contract midway through the 2012-2013 season. That move was a huge catalyst for Miami that season as the team managed to go 37-3 in games that Anderson appeared in. He would hang around Miami for a season and a half after LeBron left before being traded to the Memphis Grizzlies. Anderson then joined the former teammates club in Cleveland during James' second stint with the Cavs before calling it a day in 2017. Norris Cole was basically a lesser Mario Chalmers, which is not a good thing. There was always this sneaking suspicion that Cole was handpicked by LeBron because of the two's shared Ohio roots. Whether that was true or not remains to be seen, but taking Cole was definitely a swing and a miss by Miami. Case in point, Jimmy Butler was taken two selections after Cole. Let that sink in, but hey, Miami eventually got their man anyway. Turning our attention back to Cole, his NBA fortunes took a turn for the worse as soon as James left Miami. He was traded to New Orleans midway through that first LeBron season. Cole hung around the league until the end of the 2015-2016 season, although he was not particularly effective. No team signed him after that, and Cole played in China before the Thunder handed him a lifeline at the end of the 2016-17 season. He hasn't appeared in an NBA game since then, but continues to play overseas to this day. Richard Lewis didn't do a hell of a lot while he was with the Miami Heat, but every once in a while, you would get a glimpse of the awesome player he once was. In particular, Lewis's run during the 2013 Eastern Conference Finals was pretty epic. He would try to keep his career going in Dallas after the Heatles run ended, but was cut before that season started and his last NBA game came in 2014. We now turn our attention to those players who were in Miami for a long time, but not particularly a good time, or I guess I should say not a productive time. We start with James Jones. Everyone has raved about what a great teammate Jones was, and apparently it was a sentiment LeBron agreed with. Not only did the sharpshooter hang around all four years with him in Miami, but he would follow James to Cleveland for an additional three seasons. Jones would eventually call it a day in 2017 after he was appointed Director of Player Personnel for the Phoenix Suns. The Heat didn't sign Jawan Howard for on-court contributions. That was known from the moment he showed up in South Beach. What Howard was there to do was to provide a veteran presence and serve as a de facto player coach. He stayed in the role for three seasons, retiring after Miami won its second NBA championship. We move on to the inverse of those players or individuals who were in Miami for a short time, not a particularly long time. This list starts with Zadrunas Ilgoskis, who came along to Miami from Cleveland with LeBron James. Ilgoskis was a regular starter for most of the season with the Heat, but fell out of the rotation come playoff time after that one loan season in Miami, he retired. Mike Bibby arrived to the Miami Heat after being waived by the Washington Wizards late in the 2010-2011 season. He would go on to become the team's de facto starting point guard and was solid enough. It's wild to think that Bibby was only 32 years old when he linked up with the Miami Heat. Honestly, at this point in his career, Bibby seemed like he was closer to 40. After that year ended, he would play one last season with the Knicks before retiring and focusing on his bodybuilding endeavors. Tony Douglas, man. Tony Douglas was a capable but very limited point guard who you did not want playing for your team because he was super uninspiring. Douglas found his way to Miami in LeBron's last season as part of the trade for the aforementioned Joel Anthony. Douglas would stick around the NBA for a few more years before finding a pretty successful career overseas where he still plays. The ultimate bench gunner, Eddie House, was signed by the Heat ahead of the 2010-2011 season because he could make threes and had some NBA championship experience. Look, House did his thing during that first season in Miami. He had his moments. He would stick around the following year but never actually appeared 
in a game for the Heat and was eventually released midway through the season. Carlos Arroyo entered the first Heatle season as the team's starting point guard and was serviceable, I suppose. However, he would eventually be replaced by Mario Chalmers. Having fallen out of the rotation, Arroyo was released in March so Miami could sign Mike Bibby. He did, however, catch on with the Boston Celtics for the remainder of 2011. At the end of the year, he opted for a return to Europe and he played overseas for a few more years before retiring. The he would sign Roger Mason as the 2013-2014 season was approaching and they were just looking for some bodies. He appeared in 25 games for the team but was deemed expendable and shipped to Sacramento with Miami wanting to clear roster space for the buyout market. He would be waived by the Kings shortly thereafter and never appeared in another NBA game. We now turn our attention to the seemingly never ending parade of random bigs who had a cup of coffee in Miami during the Heatles there. Let's start with Jamal McGlure. McGlure had basically become the basketball equivalent to a hockey goon at this late stage of his career. He was basically just there for the ride during the Big Three's first season together. Despite offering little to no basketball contributions, McGlure would milk one final season in Toronto after leaving Miami. The Washington Wizards traded Ronnie Turioff to the Denver Nuggets at the 2012 NBA trade deadline and he was promptly waived by his new team. Miami signed him a few days later and he had an occasional role for the side during the rest of the season and in the playoffs. Turioff would manage a few more seasons in the pros but played sparingly during this time before retiring. The Miami Heat held the 32nd pick in the 2010 NBA draft, the 32nd pick otherwise known as the second pick in the second round. A selection that can have some value. There are still some good players available and you can find a contributor or role player here. With that in mind, it must be noted that the decision is still a little more than two weeks away from airing on ESPN. So no one really knows what LeBron is going to do at this moment in time. And while the Heat front office didn't exactly know what was to come, Taking Dexter Pittman here, it seemed like a bad idea regardless of if the big three was formed or not. That's because Miami already had Joel Anthony and Jamal McGlure on the roster who were just older versions of Pittman. As for the rookie, he had no impact in his first season, played a bit part in year two, spent most of his time in the G League, and was traded for nothing in year three of the Heatles. Pittman has since gone on to have a long career on the international scene. Feeling that three slow lumbering big men were not enough for the team, the Heat went out and signed Eric Dampier after he had been released by the Charlotte Bobcats. He played a fair amount in that 2010-2011 season while Udonis Haslam was injured, but Dampier didn't make any postseason appearances as the power forward had returned to the lineup. Eric Dampier would play for one more season in the NBA, signing with the Atlanta Hawks where he appeared in 15 games. From big men to big names, we now look at those Miami Heat players who had a pretty big reputation but ultimately delivered a minimal impact. Perhaps there was no more bigger disappointment for those Heatles than Michael Beasley. There was really a belief that Beasley could inject some much needed youth and just energy into a Heat roster that was consistently struggling to get meaningful minutes out of its random assortment of 30 something ring chasers, lumbering centers, and misfit point guards. More importantly, the price was right for the Heat as Beasley had developed this reputation as a flawed player, damaged good, someone who wasn't ever going to live up to the potential. The move though, well, it didn't really work out for either party. Beasley was in and out of the rotation for the entire 2013-2014 season. Having not rebuilt his reputation, Beasley agreed to play in China the following season before linking up with Miami for a third time toward the back end of the year. Beasley has since bounced around both the NBA and China over the past decade or so. 
Greg Oden arrived in Miami with similar hype to Beasley, albeit for totally different reasons. Several teams were really desperate to sign the former number one overall pick who had claimed he was finally healthy after years of injuries that kept him out of basketball. Eventually, he agreed to a deal with the Heat who landed a low-risk, high-reward big man. There was to be no reward for Miami, however, as Odin looked like a shell of his former self. Essentially, he was a thinner, younger version of Joel Anthony. Odin never played in the NBA again after his stint with the Heat, but he has made a few basketball appearances here and there since that cameo, including in the basketball tournament, or TBT. Jerry Stackhouse signed at the very start of LeBron James' tenure in Miami, although he would only appear in seven games for the team before being released. He was waived so they could sign Eric Dampier after the injury to Udonis Haslam. Stackhouse wouldn't play another game in the NBA that season, but somehow managed to get another two years out of his career after being cut. Another Hail Mary toss here by the Heat that ended in an incomplete pass. Eddie Curry had not appeared in an NBA game since December 2009 when he signed a contract with the Heat in December of 2011. In fact, the big man had only made 10 appearances in total since the start of the 2008-2009 season. Despite this, Miami was compelled to sign him, but he would do nothing of note. Curry would go on to appear in a couple of games for the Dallas Mavericks the following season before finding work in China. Finally, we conclude with the players who are really nothing more than roster filler, 10-day contract guys, or just ones who just sort of sit on the end of the bench leading the cheer squad. Let's start with Terrell Harris. Harris began his career in the G League and overseas before being signed by Miami during the 2011-2012 season. He lasted about a year all told with the team before being waived during the following year. Harris would finish that campaign with New Orleans, but it was his last NBA appearance. He spent some time in the G League before playing in Israel. Mikhail Gladness inked a couple of 10-day contracts with the Heat during the 2011 and 2012 season. It didn't work out long-term there, but he did land another 10-day contract with the Golden State Warriors the following year. Since then, he's become a basketball version of where in the world is Carmen Sandiego. Josh Harrelson, the master of jorts, signed a contract with the Heat in the summer of 2012-2023 with the team wanting to kick the tires on him to see if he could serve as a stretch four or a stretch big. It did not work out for him. He only played six games for the team before being waived. Harrelson then signed with the Detroit Pistons for the following season, but that was his last NBA action. He's since gone on to have a pretty long career in Japan, though. Jarvis Varnado played a total of 37 NBA games, but spent most of his time stateside on 10-day contracts. He nabbed a championship ring for his troubles in Miami, so it wasn't all bad. Varnado has also spent some time in the G League while playing for several teams in Europe and South America. The Heat signed DeAndre Liggins to two separate 10-day contracts during the dying days of the team's dynasty. He played one game in that span. Beyond that, Liggins bounced around the NBA between stints in Europe. The honor of being the last ever signing of the Heatles heir goes to Justin Hamilton, who would ink his agreement with Miami in March of 2014. He was 23 at the time and seen as a prospect at the center position. Hamilton had actually spent training cap in Miami, so there was some familiarity between the two sides. The center stuck with the Heat that following year, actually appearing in 24 games for them before being traded. Most of his career since has been spent in China. There you have it, the story of what happened to every single one of LeBron James' teammates in Miami. You have a total of 33 players here. Zero are currently active and only one managed to appear in an NBA game beyond 2019. Only one appeared in a game in the 2020s is what I'm saying here. 
There are various reasons for this, but to me it is absolutely fascinating that a dynasty that ended relatively recently, I mean 10 seasons is obviously a long time in professional sports, but you would think at least a few players, one or two, would still be active in the NBA. Alas, that is not the case. LeBron James is the last Heatle. That does it for me. I'm Cheyenne Hollis. This is The Touchback. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you like. And as always, hashtag take it out to the 25.